got to make it easy for people. You've got to provide the right facilities. You've got to have your hand sanitizer right where people are going to see it and just set up your systems, your processes in a way that that just flows, that happens consistently. This is, this is again, a staph skin infection, but this is the one that's particularly infectious. And this is the one that spreads like wildfire in institutions like schools and gyms. It's, if you were a fungus and you wanted a part of the body to live in and thrive in, this is the this is your dream. Ugh. It's sweaty. You've got skin folds against each other. It's just a perfect place to live. You, you're going to set up camp here, make your home, and be happy as Larry. That'd be suffice That's or not, not going to no. suffice because as we as we mentioned with those spores, they're they're almost microscopic. They're tiny and a, a porous thing like a rash guard that is not going to stop something that small it'll just pass through hey, look at that Fuck. yeah <laughs> alright so someone's <laughs> someone's training with a set of these cleats right yeah. <laughs> right yeah. and I'll see that and I'll go to yeah. go to go to a straight foot lock do I not touch that foot Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video on the way in and please subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying our content. Today's episode is Dr. Will Duffin. Dr. Will was on episode one. He is a GP. Um, he's also a medical director of World Extreme Medicine and a specialist training in dermatology. Today, he is gonna to be talking to us about skin infections, specifically in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and grappling sports, everything from staph infections to ringworm and everything else. So if you're a gym owner, if you're a Jiu-Jitsu practitioner or athlete, then keep watching. This is the episode for you. Dr. Will, welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me back. Absolute pleasure. So I think we last saw you about 31 episodes ago. Yeah. Back so, yeah. in day one. It was indeed, mate. In its infancy. Indeed. Yeah. And last time, of course, you came on, you, you came on more as a GP, which is one of your sort of couple of hats that you wear. Today, you're back with us to chat about skin infections. Um, Danny and I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and skin infections are a bit of a nuisance to say the least. Um, of course you do your work with World Extreme Medicine, um, do a lot of sort of uh, work in the, in the wild and, and come across all sorts of conditions. Um, in addition, you have some additional training, I believe as well. That's right. As well as being a frontline GP, Devon based GP, I've, um, done extra training in skin problems and I see a lot of that in day-to-day -day practice and also being an active uh, person I'm you know trained three times a week in a CrossFit box and uh, you see a lot of this in in, in that setting as well uh, I think there's I, I'm here really on a bit of a mission to do some I want to give your audience some dependable health advice in this important area and do a bit of myth debunking mm. and um, you know it's a really important topic and uh, yeah, there's a lot of Little hearsay and, and mythology out there. I'm hoping we can we can sort some of that out today. Yeah, no, perfect. And and yeah, we, we find that a lot, don't we? Yeah. I think the advice floating around the gym. Well, you speak to one person, it's one thing. Speak to someone else, it's another. So it'd be good to offer some real clarity and, and try and keep our gyms and our teammates a lot healthier and on the mats training more. So that'd be good. Uh, so what we'll do today is there's a number of different conditions that we tend to see. Um, so I have pulled together some lovely photos. Love it. Which we can share on the screen behind us. Um, and yeah, we'll just get your initial reaction. You can tell us what you think it is and maybe we'll work through that. Um, Danny will get <laughs> your reaction as well, which I'm sure you fucking dreaded this already. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, that's, uh, let's make a start. So let me just uh, get these pictures up. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna move out the way so uh, our audience can actually see what we're looking at. But yeah, what are we looking at here, first of all? All right, so we've got a, a area of erythema, it's the medical term, so redness in this, the armpit, the axilla of this poor guy. I think this is a staph infection. It looks to me like a boil or a pharyncal, it's a technical term. I, I, that area is probably very hot, it's tender to touch. Um, and, and this is a very common skin infection that we'd see, and it's re primarily an infection of the the hair follicle in the armpit there that's expanded out into a into a deeper boil mm -hmm. and it's where that staph that often staph aureus which is a, a bacteria that commonly lives on people's skin it's, uh it, it can get into their hair follicle and and cause deeper infection like this and uh yeah it's pretty pretty unpleasant yeah so this is a, a staph infection so this is a I, in my opinion, certainly in my experience, probably the one of the more common ones that you see. Um, so, so does it present in the other ways, or is it typically like this? I think we've got a couple more pictures. So yeah. I don't know if we should we scroll through those as Go well. Ahead. Yeah. 
Uh, so that's it. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> Fucking so this, beauty, that one. <laughs> yeah, so this is a real up close one. So this is, um, yeah, what we're we seeing here. It's a be- yeah, it's a really pointing at us, that, that one, isn't it? That, that is another boil. Again, scat staph infection, and sometimes they can you can form pus under the skin that turns into a big abscess. And if it gets really big, sometimes that needs a what we call incision and drainage, so a bit of a bit of surgery to open it up and drain the pus out. But most of these tend to drain by themselves, so they form a head like this, and then that top will just open, uh, the roof will open, and the the pus will drain out, and that's normally where it resolves. We do sometimes give antibiotics by mouth to help. With, with these if they get particularly infected but um yeah okay <laughs> and so does it present any other way so you've got this is it always a singular thing or is it does it do you get multiple boils or how does it normally look yeah well if it's involving a hair follicle it can start off with something called folliculitis right. which is infection of the the follicle which is often caused by staph and that's normally little um, painful bumps on the skin uh, but there's another form of, of staph called impetigo which is probably the more contagious version that you're going to see in your average um, gym environment this this kind of infection here boils are le- not so contagious that, that they're more to do with the um, some people are just more prone to getting them and they form in in uh, in skin that's perhaps quite sweaty and uh, areas of the body that are naturally quite moist and uh personal hygiene definitely comes into it so they're not as contagious as other forms of skin staph infections the, the big one that we, we're going to see in, in in close contact sports where you're rolling and grappling is is in patigo and that looks a little bit different than this okay um and th- this is one of those things that i've heard previously that like once you catch it it's like you have it in you so in regard to avoiding this type of thing, mm. you obviously mentioned about hygiene a second ago, but is it, is it avoidable or is it just, you know, is it just one of those things that you're going to catch in those environments? With, with boils, yeah. uh, less so, less avoidable. I think it's some people, unfortunately, just prone to, prone to getting them and in particularly in hot, sweaty environments, they, they happen. And you, you, yes, you can massively up your game with your personal hygiene, but they, they will just come and go whereas the the impetigo side that is much more contagious between one person to another so that that's really where so if someone if someone had this um say they had a spot and it looked really similar to this and then you know once it stopped hurting would they be all right to go on the mats and train again while this is still not like not quite like this but maybe once it cleared up a little bit there's still like a little bit of redness you don't think that's contagious at that point not all staph infections are the same so for me this i i i'm about like if it's folliculitis if it's that sort of like you know that pore that's got infected you can kind of tell yeah yeah said Um, i mean with that would they in theory yes you could still spread staff to your training partner i I think with all these infections the safest option is always to refrain uh until you're on treatment i mean once you've had a couple of days of antibiotics once that pus is drained this is no longer likely to be infectious okay yeah so just wait so there's no pus not minging and then you can go back yeah yeah once it's burnt out if you like once it's it's the pain's gone the redness has settled uh, and it's not draining pus anymore and you've been on antibiotics say for maybe three or four days something like this you know the chance of that being infectious is much lower yeah okay so in, in regard to treatment you just touched on it then but antibiotics is, is that is that what you need for this not necessarily for, for small boils yeah. like this actually in my experience they do tend to resolve on the whole without any specific treatment um as long as they eventually come to a head and drain uh, job done if they're in a more sensitive area in the groin or uh, around the buttock uh, or they get very elbow. big elbow maybe <laughs> or if it develops a big abscess yeah. you, you can feel there's some fluid under there then they need it might need a bit more treatment but the smaller ones usually sort themselves out yeah okay um and i'm going to show you this because i can't pronounce it but that that particular type of staff there uh, yeah well the top one yeah how would you pronounce that staphylococcus aureus very good <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> i'd love to see you try that i'm not even going to do it to myself <laughs> yeah, yeah um so so i think that one in particular is quite common yeah and from what i understand that's a, a type of mrsa which we know is is quite can be quite lethal um and some of the i've not got any pictures of it on my laptop right now to show but some of the pictures that i've seen as a result of this have been holes in people like yeah so it's it feels like that particular type of staff is quite serious 
Is that right? Well, okay, let's talk about staph and MRSA. So staphylococcus, coccus just means it's round-shaped bacteria. Bacillus is a rod-shaped one. So that just describes a shape. Aureus means golden, because you sometimes get this kind of golden crust, particularly with impetigo. Um, and there is a, a, a variant of staph, which is called MRSA, and that stands for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And a lot of people are obviously afraid of this. You see it in the media. You get these... Um, cases of really nasty infections in, in particularly in hospital environments. And it's actually MRSA is not any worse than your run of the mill staff. About one to 3% of people will have it just living in their body and their nose on their skin. That, that's called a, uh, uh, kind of a, a skin commensal or something, a bug, a bacteria that just lives on your skin normally without causing any problems. About 15% of people will have normal just regular staff on their skin anyway, without causing problems. And the reason MRSA can be a, a difficult is it's resistant to a lot of antibiotics. So when it does go on to cause infection, it's not just sitting on your skin, it penetrates into the skin and causes infection. It's harder to treat because a lot of an antibiotics that we have don't work on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So that's the issue. So the antibiotics stop working and then it's like, oh shit. Like, yeah, then you can be in a bit of a spot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So would that be typically where you see people with skin and lumps getting cut out of them and stuff to, to remove it or? Yeah. I, 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 so if, if you send a swab of the, the skin, if you've got a boil that's not, not resolving and there's pus coming out, we can send a sample of that to the lab look at it down the microscope try and culture it grow it in a petri dish and then you can work out what kind of organism you're dealing with and if it's an mrsa then you, you just know it's, it's going to be a harder fight to, to get that sorted out but it, it's it's much less common we tend to see it in hospitalized patients so it's where that tends to spread um, but in, in in something like this that isn't resolving then a skin swab from your gp or your health provider is a good way to get a feel for you know what what, what's going on could this be something like that yeah okay and what's this right what we've got here so we've got an uh an eye a, a little what, what do you think this might be danny let me ask you sty yeah spot on don't need, don't need a gp here you've got all expertise over here <laughs> and, and, and what, what's a sty <laughs> So this is another form of, again, staph lives, this lives all of the skin, lives on your skin all over your body, including your eyelid. And sometimes it can get into the, the little glands, they're called your meibomian glands, and it can penetrate inside and cause infection. And this is like a little boil, if you like, of your eyelid. So a tiny little boil. These are pain in the ass they're really uncomfortable but they're not normally a serious infection and again they don't actually need any antibiotics on the most part they get better by themselves very common and, and this isn't actually particularly contagious if you if you were to roll with someone who had this I, I wouldn't be too concerned okay all right good and then this next one is a bit uglier so what have we got here right so this is the this is the nasty one that we, we talk this is impetigo right and this is, this is, again, a staph skin infection, but this is the one that's particularly infectious. And this is the one that spreads like wildfire in institutions like schools and gyms, for example, because close to c contact with the skin uh, can spread that bacteria from one person to the, to the other. And the, we can, there's, impetigo is characterized by this kind of honey golden crust that forms on the skin. That's the aureus bit of the staph aureus. And you can get this version called bullus impetigo where these big blisters form. And often that those blisters pop and it releases all this fluid and it's just a bit wet and manky. Um, and yeah, I would definitely advise getting this treated with antibiotics. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're not getting that treated, you've got something wrong with yeah. you, haven't you? <laughs> Jesus. We tend to, in, in general practice, I you see this a lot in children around the mouth. You don't tend to see it in adults unless they're training something like BJJ where they're in close contact with each other. Yeah. Um, so it's actually relatively uncommon in the general adult population, yeah. apart from you, you know your, your, your audience who yeah. will see this a fair bit. So this is already quite interesting because I always thought that um, staph infection was one thing and impetigo was something different. Yeah. yeah so what you're saying different. is is impetigo tiger is a type of staph infection. Yeah. And what we'll learn about skin infections is that certain uh, organisms, certain bacteria, virus or viruses or fungi will 
present in different ways and they'll look different depending on the, the, the body part that they're in, infecting. Um, and that, that is one of the big challenges of skin disease is, is interpreting what you're, what you're seeing. You're just seeing one bit of manky skin can look very similar to the other, but what's going on underneath the surface can, can be very different and the treatment required and the approach can be very yeah. different. Yeah. Okay. Um, once we've gone through the different pictures and um, conditions, we're, we're going to do a bit of a summary in regard to what gyms and athletes can do. But it might be quite good, I think, as we work through, just to talk about, um, I guess, like sort of time off the mats and, and return to play and that type of thing for each specific condition. So it feels like staph infection is a bit of an umbrella term. Um, so the untrained jiu-jitsu practitioner isn't going to know the difference between a contagious impetigo and a not contagious maybe a sty perhaps because it's in the eye, but one of the less concerning ones. So what's the advice for, for somebody doing jiu-jitsu or wrestling or MMA or any, you know, rugby, whatever, um, who identifies this on the skin? Um, we, we, we talked on a couple of occasions and you know better than anybody in regard to getting a GP appointment. Sometimes it's difficult. So is the advice that they, they spend a period of time off the mats? What would you suggest? Yeah, I think the first part of this is recognition, is knowing that there's a, a skin infection there not just for the coaches but for the um the members of that of that gym so they're aware of what to look out for and that there's not so much stigma that they're not able to kind of disclose that um and that's why kind of education pieces like this i think are really useful and what you know for impetigo we're looking at these kind of crusted painful red bumps on the skin with a bit of background redness and maybe some open sores where there's a bit of fluid coming out if you have anything like that always think could this be impetigo particularly if you've then got that like honey golden crust it's disgusting isn't it <laughs> <laughs> in which case if it's a localized area so a small cluster of these little bumps you could get antibiotic cream that normally sorts it out within a week just twice a day antibiotic cream if it's a more uh, a, a wider area then you might need antibiotics by mouth flu cloxacillin is the one we commonly use and once the you've had good say two to three days of antibiotics and those crusts of they're not wet they start to heal over you're unlikely to still be infectious so i the, the key really is it needs to be resolving um, and they need to have been on s s antibiotics for at least two to three days before they can then return to play. All right, perfect. Yeah, so that's that's a lot better than I thought. I thought it was going to be a couple of weeks, to be fair. So that's... Yeah, that's way better. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And I think some of the issues is... So we, we talked about this a bit offline, and, and you'll agree. There's a couple of things that happen in the gym space, right? So people get really obsessive about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and the, the worry that they take, you know, even you know a few days, let alone a few weeks off the mat, you know, could be devastating for some people. And then people use it for different reasons. So obviously there's a skill acquisition that people worry they'll fall behind on if they're not, you know, sort of consistent. But equally, some people use it for mental health. Um, so I think what happens is people will get something like this yeah. and they'll think, shit, I don't want to be off the mat for a couple of weeks and they'll conceal it or they'll, they'll not tell people. And I think that's where it tends to spread a little bit. There's that. And then of course, there's just the genuine people don't know what it is. And hopefully we're solving that problem today. But I think that offers some reassurance that if people are taking a couple of days off the mats, they can sit on the side of the mats, watch, but don't get on the mats for a couple of days once you've been on the antibiotics. And then once it starts healing and resolving, then you're pretty much good to go. I think it's really important as well to get, go and see a GP or go and see someone and get some antibiotics because a lot of people just leave it, don't they? Yeah. You know, they just leave it, maybe put some cream on it. Yeah you know, and, yeah. then, and hope for the best really. Yeah, it? yeah. And these and are treatable infections. They generally respond quite quickly. Can they, can, yeah. just a quick one. Can they, if you was to put say, um, like a cream on it, I don't know, like an antifungal cream. Um, so this is a bacterial infection. Yeah, yeah, I know. But pe what I'm saying is that from, from what people say in the gym, yeah. they probably see this, not know it's a bacterial infection, thinking it's a fungal infection. Mm. Put a fungal cream on it or whatever. And maybe, I don't know, does it, does this sort of stuff, does it get, can it come, can it get, better look better at times and then flare back up is that a thing yeah. or does it that's because yeah. what i was thinking is oh you got you got like a little rash it may not be as extreme as this um you think it's a bit of impetigo whatever it is you put some cream on it, it it calms down maybe and then they go back on the mats and then it flares back up and then they've give it to five people it would could that happen could it flare? Can it flare up? Yeah, it could, down especially if, it's if you not un, if you undertreated it. So you only yeah. gave yourself a couple of days of antibiotics. So you kept missing doses. You know, people aren't always that good at taking yeah. their medicine, uh, even when it's prescribed. Then, yet yeah, in theory, it could. If you haven't 
adequately treated it, it could come back and bite you again. Equally, in real life, even if you took this to a GP, that it it never presents like the textbooks. You get lots of, I see lots of manky bits of skin that isn't quite clear cut. You're thinking, is this fungal? Is this bacterial? Is it maybe viral? You're not quite sure. You have to hedge a little bit. So that someone might start you on an antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial, with a view to then following you up. And if it hasn't responded, they might try something different. So there is a bit of trial and error here. Then you might not necessarily be put on the right treatment first time if it's got a few borderline features and isn't quite a typical presentation of that thing. But I'm not encouraging your audience to necessarily self-diagnose and say, I need to be able to spot what's what's fungal, what's bacterial, what's viral. But just to recognize when this could be something that's not just going to affect your own health, but also the health of the well-being of other yeah, people in the, yeah, the facility you train at. Last question, and then we'll probably move on, I think. But I've had some form of staff previously on a couple of occasions. And when I had it, sometimes I know it breaks out on my chin a little bit. And I always get like a swelling. So I think it's my, is it your glands or your lymph, lymph, lymph nodes? In your neck, yeah. Um, and sometimes I can feel quite unwell with it as well. So with bacterial infections, sort of the, the bad, the, you know, the sort of worst ones, is that typically something you'd expect as well? Would somebody stop feeling a bit under the weather or is it just the skin thing? Yeah, sometimes that's possible, particularly under the chin there, Paul. It, we, we've got lots of hair follicles, mm. Sly, and, and that's where you probably had a bit of folliculitis, that condition we talked about earlier. Yeah. And that infection under the skin, uh, your body drains that infection to the lymph nodes, which sit under your chin there, and, and they all might get get more painful and inflamed that's very common it's not uncommon either to feel a bit uh, a bit under the weather but if you get really feverish and you you're very unwell you're not eating or drinking there is always possible to get more serious infection things like sepsis i say that's uncommon with skin infections but it, it can still happen so if, if you are if you're if you are systemically unwell with any of this then definitely do see your gp or health provider yep. all right good stuff all right so that's bacterial infections what's going on guys this episode is sponsored by eden clinic for men who specialize in men's health and male hormones the details are on the screen now and in the description below head on over to their website and get yourself booked in for a blood test select edp which is the everyday perspective to get yourself a discount in addition to male hormones such as testosterone these tests also look at other health markers such as diabetes type 2 heart health liver function and kidney function the clinic is run by Dr. Angela Service, who featured on episode 13, where she spoke in length about the negative symptoms that men can experience if they're deficient in some of these hormones, such as low mood, low libido, fatigue, and weight gain. So if either you, maybe one of your mates, your dad isn't feeling quite right, then it's worth having a look at some of these metrics and some of these markers to see how your health is on the inside. Even if you are feeling tip-top, it's worth having a look now because in the future that may change. And it gives you the ability to look back and have a benchmark. This is something that we feel really passionate about, guys. Otherwise, we literally wouldn't be telling you about it. Dr. Angela Service and her team can work wonders in regard to getting things corrected and improving your life and your health. It isn't something worth taking a chance on, fellas. So get on over and get yourself booked in. Awesome, guys. Thanks for your time. Back to the episode. All right. So let's see what we got next. <laughs> so what is this? Okay, yeah, this looks to me like ringworm. Okay, and what is ringworm? Ringworm is a, a fungal infection of the skin. It's incredibly common. It's got nothing to do with worms whatsoever. I think it was a, <laughs> when it was the first, worst name ever. It is because if, yeah. if it was called like I don't know something fa like something fancy or just something that sounded normal, you know, you say to someone you got ringworm, they think even fucking... even ring rash, oh, yeah, ring rash. Yeah, exactly. yeah. It makes me think of when your dog had worms and you just scoop his yeah, butt across the carpet. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's a terrible name. It's confused people for for decades. Yeah. Hundreds it needs, of years it, needs probably. it needs changing. It needs changing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, oh, but it's it's called ringworm because you can see it's got this ring appearance. It often appears like as a little small badge or a plaque is the, the technical term on the skin, or, uh, which is a bit red, a bit scaly. And then it spreads outwards in this ring form. And the active edge is that red bit on the edge. That's the active bit where the fungus is in the skin. It's growing, it's multiplying. And that spreads outwards. And as it grows outwards, the center resolves, actually heals. And it, and it can grow out in that way. And that that's that kind of characteristic pattern that you're looking for. It's not unlike staph infections, bacterial infections. It tends not to be red and painful. It's it's dry rather than wet. It's, it's more kind of a scaly type infection. But crucially, it's 
the actual underlying cause is very different. This is now a fungus and not a bacteria. And fu fungi are fascinating. This is uh, what we call tinea corporis is the official medical term. And it's, ca it's caused by a dermatophyte infection something like trichophyton, and they are comprised of little spores, which are like little cells, tiny little beads, and then hyphae, which are like these little uh, fronds that grow out of them. And those, those tiny bead-like cells are so light and small, they, they can travel in the air and they can be transmitted from one person to another very easily. In the world around us, we're surrounded by fungal spores. They're like the seeds of the the uh the the, the uh, skin infection world if you like you know when you, you leave a yogurt in the fridge for too long and then you open it up three weeks later in midnight and you've got back from the pub and you're starving and it's furry inside and you think how the, how, how the fuck did that get in there it's because that fungus that's grown in yogurt is just ubiquitous it's it's in the world around us all times and because it's so transmissible, because they're so successful as an organism at moving from one location to the next, these can really spread very readily in close contact environments like um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu mm. gyms. Yeah, I, I think this is probably on par, I'd say, with staff, maybe even worse, in fact, for prevalence, it seems. I think it's worse, yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think people get the odd staff infection, but m <laughs> most people get, get ringworm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so you mentioned like the, the middle bit resolving a little bit and you said it's not normally too red and angry looking. Yeah. Then we got this. Yeah. Get you said that's a, perhaps a more developed <laughs> bit of ringworm there. You could still see that the edge. So it's, um, yeah. it's got this kind of scalloped edge and the edge is slightly more raised, but the whole plaque that is, is quite scaly um, and, and over time that, that center piece there will start to, resemble healthy normal skin as that heals and then that that leading edge there will will expand outwards mm -hmm. and to be honest it is generally a self-limiting infection if you didn't treat this at all over time your body's own immune system would most likely clear this but in that process you're going to probably spread it to everyone around you <laughs> that you have close contact with uh, and it is a bit uncomfortable and unpleasant so it, it's definitely worth getting it sorted out yeah and th 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 this is the one that i've seen leave a few scars as well yeah yeah, yeah i got a scar on my leg now can do, yeah. looking at it yeah. yeah it's a big scar on my leg from it yeah okay um let's look at a couple more pictures um so we've got this one and i've put this in actually because the the, the those last couple on the arm very obvious yeah but but this in the hairline seems to be like the a, a, not again where people miss it, and I know I've had uh, you know sort of friends over the years where you know you'd be sat on the mat and they'll they'll turn around and they've got something right up on the back of their leg, uh, you know they're never going to see it there. So that's obviously one place on the body where you may not see it. Um, this it feels like is another, and I and I wonder if people have got long hair or long beards or whatever. I I feel, I feel like this is a real issue because. Unless you're really digging through your scalp, and I know you're pretty good with yeah, this, but yeah. a lot of lads and girls probably wouldn't be. I mean, yeah, like this is the same thing, right? Just in the hairline. Yeah, you can see all the features there. That scalloped edge there. It's got, it's got this kind of disc appearance to it, and, and sometimes with this, you can even get a bit of non-scarring hair loss as well. Interesting. And this okay. is called tinea capitis. Capitis just means head. And it can be a bit more difficult to treat. Once you start getting tinea or fungal infection in the scalp, it's, it doesn't always respond to an antifungal creams. And in some cases, and this is much more common in, in younger adults and children, you might need antifungal tablets to, to resolve this. So is that why some of, some of the lads at the gym, they've, uh, especially in their heads and around their heads, they seem to get it back and they're like pretty frustrated because they'll, they'll get it back and they'll be like, oh, I've been, you know, I've only come back two weeks and then they'll find like they'll get their hair cut and see there's another little mark it's not nothing major but it'll be something maybe a little bit smaller than that little circle little mark yeah. and is that why it keeps coming back yeah, because it it's be in the hair yeah it penetrates quite deep into the scalp and it, oh, it can be yeah that, it can be tricky it? to, because, to, to yeah, shift th because then they you, you see hear them and they're like oh you know I have a train with someone again who's got it or someone else has got it and it and it may not be that they've even trained with someone else again it's it's still on their skin it's still on there so if it's in the scalp is that typically is it that's kind of a worse version than on your arm or does it is it done well like that it depends i mean this that actually look this is on the hairline so it's really this is borderline country and i think this probably would respond to topical or cream-based treatments 
But as I said, the, the further up into your scalp it goes, the, the harder it's going to be to potentially to treat. Yeah, okay. And in regards to the treatment, I've popped this one in here as well because this is obviously using a, a cream. Um, so I think Doctarin, Doctarin? Yeah, it seems to, cool, yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah. the one that I've used. And, I, and I've yeah. put this picture in because I was told by another GP um, and I think this is a common mistake that people make is she was quite specific that when you put the cream on, you need to do like a two centimeter perimeter around uh, the actual ring um, in order to treat it. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that, that's good. Good practice. And, and you can actually buy a lot of these creams over the counter. You don't necessarily need a prescription. If it's something you know that you've you get frequently and you've had that diagnosis before, any uh, imidazole cream such as myconazole, clotrimazole, turbinafine, they're usually available over the counter and apply that cream twice a day, liberally like this, usually for about a week. Uh, and if it hasn't responded at all in that time, then, then definitely get checked out and make sure there's nothing else going on. And I think the other thing that she may have said is that you need to continue it after the rash is gone, because this is something that I found. And I think you just touched on it as well, is I had a, I had a, a ring on my arm and it got quite angry, put the cream on it, it went away. I stopped creaming after a while, it then popped back up. Yeah. Um, did it again it, three times it came back in the same spot and the first one it was just one clear ring and then it actually came in two little couple of patches almost like portions of the original one and then in the third time it came back as a full ring again so what's happening there it's it again it depends on how established that infection is and also everyone responds differently to treatment and it's possible to under treat to stop your treatment course prematurely and for it, then that that um organism to rebound uh and it yeah like you say it can be quite hard to know when do i complete the treatment and again it's really key to monitor it, your the response and if it's shrinking down quite quickly you're likely to need a shorter course but if it's a big lesion that you're dealing with you, you might need to treat for you know two three weeks potentially it really depends on what you're what you're dealing with and and how long is it um once you start creaming how long is it contagious for uh so with tinea like this it it's not that contagious once it's treated once you've been on antibiotics for again two to three days in normal cases that would stop that would kill most of the the active uh, fungus in in that area and it's not then going to be sending spores out into the world and, and your into your training partners uh, so actually, it's shorter than you might think. Two two to three days of of good solid treatment is normally enough. And then, as a, I would say, as a precaution, it might be helpful if you're able to to cover this up with some kind of occlusive tape when you're training, at least as a, a matter of courtesy. Um, even once you've you've so got people, it under a lot control. of the times they hide them with rash guards, so they wear like a long sleeve t shirt. Would that be yeah, suffice that's or not? not? Going to no. suffice because as we as we mentioned with those spores, they're they're almost microscopic. They're tiny and a porous thing like a rash guard that is not going to stop something that small it'll just pass through so you say they're, they're with antibiotics but if they're just using say for example dactorin just yeah. to get rid of the cream uh, oh, so i might have said antibiotics yeah, now. what sorry. i meant was antifungals so okay. yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That, that's right, okay, in yeah. incredibly confusing isn't okay, it yeah. yeah this is not an antibiotic sensitive infection okay. this needs an antifungal in in, in midazole yeah. So, yeah all right so you start using the cream two or three days it's starting to just die down a little bit. Yeah. Um, so at that point, you're comfortable that people can get back on the mats. Yeah. In th again, it I think what would be helpful for gym owners is to have a clear policy on this. So it's fair for everyone. Uh, and it, it just makes it, makes it uh, you know, transparent on what the expectation is on those people who are training. Yeah. But the general advice is, yeah, three days of antibiotics is normally enough to prevent this from being infective. Yeah, and then just, just circling back to the, the, the point I made a minute ago, because I'm not sure if we, we come to a conclusion, um, but you, do you then need to continue with that cream for a, a period of time? And how long would that period be typically? Well, I'd say the small lesion, about a week is often enough. But again, if it, if it comes back, you might need to treat for longer. It really depends on how it responds and the size, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't have a picture of this, but there's an example of a, a friend of ours who we trained with who had a, a real issue with this. And he got it up the side of his face, up over his head. Um, and that was not going away on its own. It, it put him out for about five, six months, wasn't it? He said? Well, what happened with that was he went to a GP and the GP gave him a cream with hydrocortisone in it instead of... Uh, like Bactorin. I don't know what the difference is exactly, but you give him, um, it's still like an antifungal cream, but it's got, it's got hydrocortisone in it. So I think the hydrocortisone doesn't 
kill it the same way as Dactarin does or something and it spread even further and then we switched creams took him a while but again it went onto his head like you said so if it's gone onto his head and his hair it, it mm. probably is that other version that's probably a lot more difficult to get rid of yeah there are lots of combination creams where antifungal is is paired with a topical steroid and the reason the steroid's in there is because this is a bit unpleasant it's there's that the fungus in the skin causes inflammation and that steroid is treating the inflammation and the antifungal bit is treating the fungus. It's very common in that the steroid doesn't stop the antifungal cream from working and it's very common to prescribe them together. The, the, what we do sometimes see, there is another skin condition that can look like this, which is called discoid eczema. So it's a form of eczema that is like a, a badge-like area of redness on the skin and that is steroid responsive. That's often treated with just steroid by itself. But if you're you'll prescribe the steroid for possible eczema and it's actually a fungal infection like this. What's interesting is the that infection goes absolutely nuts. The steroid actually reduces the immune response in the skin and this infection actually thrives rather than shrinks. And it also changes in its shape and appearance and it starts looking really weird and it makes it even harder to diagnose. And the medical term for that is tinea incognito. So that's a fungal infection that's been treated with steroids by itself and it's gone weird, it's got out of hand yeah. and what it really needs is an antifungal cream. So it's interesting that how steroids can interact with fungal skin infections and actually really muddy the waters. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Because I've used a, a hydrocortisone cream when I first had it and it, it, it did make it worse. Um, and then I switched to uh, Caniston at the time because Caniston yeah. works quite well. Switched yeah. to Caniston, cleared up in like three yeah. days, you know? So it's yeah. it's so weird, isn't it? It's, I think the issue with it more so than anything is, is just getting <laughs> knowing what you've actually got on your skin, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That's the yeah. biggest issue. Yeah. All right, cool. So that's that's the first of a few fungal infections I think we're going to look at. Uh, so that's ring one. Um, <laughs> Great so far. Oh, I'm loving this. So, so, so Danny, control yourself on this next one. <laughs> oh, is it horrible? Join us, Danny. So what are we looking at here? Fucking moldy groin. <laughs> <laughs> moldy scrots, I'd call this, if I was a doctor. It this, it looks like it yes. could be an armpit or a groin. What, what do you see, Will? I'm looking, I think I'm looking at a groin. Okay. Um, he needs a shave. Yeah. He, needs a he needs a trim up. That's the first thing I'd say if I was a doctor. I'd look at that and go, right, first things first, have a trim up. Yeah, That's whatever, whatever they've got, they that for lack of uh, yeah, that yeah. yeah. <laughs> so again, this is... Uh, Tinea, so it's a dermatophyte infection, fungal infection, but presenting in a different body site. In this case, the groin. And the groin is like the, the it's if you were a fungus, you wanted a part of the body to live in and thrive in. This is the this is your dream. Yeah. It's sweaty, you've got skin folds against each other. It's just a perfect place to live. You you're gonna set up camp here, make your home and be happy as Larry. And you can see there, it's got similar to the, the the fungal infection we saw on the skin, the tinea corporis that we saw in the last few slides. It's still got some of the same features. You can see that inflamed edge there. It's still got that ring-like appearance yeah. to it, but it's in the groin. It's treated in a very similar way with antifungal creams. And this is, this is called jocks itch. That's the colloquial term because it's very, very common in, in younger men who are doing lots of sport and probably not showering as often as they should do. This year, say someone had this and then they trained, would, could it come out as ringworm somewhere else in the body? Or would you catch this and then get that on your groin? Does that make sense? But it can work both ways. Yeah, I mean, those so spores, if someone had this, yeah. spores are in there. And then and that, that could shed, cause... That shedding spores that could then infect someone on the skin, in which case they get the, the uh, ringworm on their, on their skin, or it can infect the groin, it can infect other parts of the body, yeah. the scalp. The, the feet it, yeah it's so hard though isn't it because like you know we've got people worried about ringworm this and that and you could just have some dirty git just not sorting themselves out having a rash like that going on the mats and giving you ringworm yeah. and in the the club or the gym or everyone's trying to do fucking loads of stuff well and, someone could have this and not you know, and no, no, you'd never it. know would yeah. you you would never know yeah so this is why it's, it's so important to re, to re, to have that education in that in your gym where people feel comfortable the stigma's gone and they're able to kind of recognize this is there and get it sorted and and, and refrain from training while while they're, that is sorted out yeah okay um right i think there's a couple more so you're in the feet on you mate yeah i love a good love, love a good toe <laughs> <laughs> so, really, really gets you going does oh, it, revved up so this this to some extent just looks like 
some dude who's run an ultra marathon who's got sore feet like what what is that what is this is this a problem yeah uh, i think this is more than just sore feet for me this looks like athlete's foot so this is a fungal infection in the foot again same organism but different body site looks very different and you can see the uh the the it's in the, this is classically in what we call a moccasin distribution so it only affects really the sweatiest part of the foot which is the sole of the foot never never affects the between the big and the second toe because the uh, or the top of the foot it's always the underside and in between the little toes you get this macerated skin you get these kind of the skin's kind of flaking away it's wet uh it's it's got this kind of slightly yellow hue to it it just looks a bit manky and unhealthy doesn't it yeah and <laughs> this is this is kind of barn door athlete's foot yeah okay so so jujitsu your feet go everywhere on people <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. in the face yeah probably everywhere. probably in the mouth yeah. on occasion yeah, yeah. but certainly on you know on the biceps on the hips on the body yeah so going back to obviously we just talked about jocks itch was that of course yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that can transfer or translate to ringworm is it the same with this as well yeah absolutely that's so, interesting isn't it yeah but for, for me, the again, like the groin, the feet are also a, a perfect breeding ground for fungi. So you don't, you won't necessarily get this from other people. You can tran transmit it between one person and another. But the, I think this is a, a, an example where the fungus is probably more responding to your own body habitus. And if you're someone that's that's just training in, in the same, I mean, BJJ is different because your feet are generally open, which, open yeah, 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 which, yeah. which helps, but it's, it's more of an issue with say endurance athletes who are in the same socks and trainers for extended periods and perhaps not washing their socks properly, not looking after their feet, that those are the people that tend to really get in trouble with do, this um, infection. Do children get this quite a lot? Yeah, they can. Yeah, yeah. It's just well, yeah. I remember when I was younger, people used to have athletes foot yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, it was definitely something that I remember being talked about more than other things for sure. Um, and then this one is this the same thing? You just mentioned something about the toes. Yeah, this is athlete. I mean, this is a form of what we call inter trigo, where there's infection between uh, two bits of skin that are you normally up against each other, and that creates a nice moist, moist dark environment for fungi to to thrive and this again is athlete's foot between the toes that's where you commonly find it in the early stages and it looks a bit manky but it, it, this is very treatable with the same creams that you'd use in your groin on your on your body uh, athlete's foot cream that you can get over the counter normally this will respond quite well to that yeah okay i've got a couple more feet pictures and then we'll, we'll kind of just chat through maybe again just just a few little bits to summarize on on this um so, so that I've got another one, second, which is far worse. But <laughs> to ease people in, like, what, what, what is this? Is this athlete's foot? Oh, man. As a GP, I see this like, so many cases of this every day. This is fungal nail infection. We've talked about scalp, groins. <laughs> Fucking does get everywhere. You're not lying, are you? Every, everywhere, everywhere. It, 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 once it gets into your I'm not going to lie. This is an absolute bastard to treat. It doesn't tend to cause many symptoms. It causes discoloration and thickening of the nail plate, which cosmetically is undesirable. But it rarely causes actual pain or discomfort. But people can get multiple nails infected, not just on their toes, but their fingernails as well. And the fungus has penetrated into the, male, the, the nail matrix. And once it's in there, it's very difficult to get rid of. You can buy nail lacquers that you can paint on the nail that are antifungal, and you need to use them for six months plus, and the, your cure rates are abysmal. The only way of really shifting this is quite hard-hitting antifungal tablets, things like turbinafine, uh, or itraconazole, which is like cracking a walnut with a sledgehammer. You're using really quite powerful drugs and they need to be used for prolonged periods, many months. And again, the cure rates are, are off. These are, for me as a GP, very disappointing to treat because patients are very understandably concerned about them, but actually my ability to, to fix this is actually quite limited. Yeah, okay. And this next one I'll show you, this is probably yeah. the worst one of the lot, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Fuck me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so someone's, <laughs> someone's training with a set of these cleats, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll see that and I'll go to, yeah. go, to, go to a straight foot lock. Do I not touch that foot? Okay, this, I mean, this looks to quite, <laughs> quite established fungal nail. 
uh, onychomycosis is the technical term. And you can see the edge of the nail there. It's lifting up and it's got very powdery and it's thick. So it's going to, it's going to scratch your skin mm -hmm. and that powder, it contains fungal spores that will then potentially seed fungus around the place. Yeah. It, and this is a really tricky one because potentially that, that is exposing you to risk of infection as well. What just um, from the so so from those like infected yeah. toes, they yeah. could just by being on the mats, by touching my arm, could give me from, ringworm from direct contact. It, yeah, yeah, could infect you with fungus. Yeah, um, but as I said, it's a very difficult thing to treat. It, it'll take many months of, of of tablet treatment to actually sort this out. So, what would your advice be then to people on the mats that, or someone's on the mat, they've got an infected toe like this? Yeah. Would you say stay off the mats, get it treated, come back on the mats because yeah. you're giving it to everyone? Or I think if it's very it depends what you're seeing. If it's just a little bit of discoloration. All right. So toe, say the first photo. The first photo, you might, you might accept that again. There's not, it's not as established. It's less okay. infectious, but the second photo, you can see that's really active infection. That nail's really crumbly and yeah. you can see there's all this powder coming off the end. I would, wouldn't want to roll with anyone <laughs> that's looking like that. Uh, so definitely advise anyone with that kind of thing to go and speak to their GP and explore the treatment options. Chop your toes off. Well, that's a bit God. drastic. <laughs> Honestly, if, I, if I've seen anyone with that, I'm going to rip yeah. their toenails off. I'm going to hold them down and, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Okay, just to, to summarise then, so we've just looked at uh, fungal infections. So we had ringworm, uh, we had uh, jock's itch, we had uh, athlete's foot, and now we've got fungal toenail. Is that what you call it? Yeah, fungal nail. Yeah, fungal nail, I think. And essentially, what you're saying is, is all of these are part of that same sort of fungal family, and all of them could potentially lead to the other. Is is that it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the advice really for for kind of people with this, and we'll, we will do like a, a more of a generalized advice for gyms and and sort of athletes or practitioners. But with these conditions, you really do need to to get them treated. Um, probably stay off the mats until you see some sort of improvement um, because they are quite infectious. And definitely with all of these, the universal thing is in upping your personal hygiene game as well and you know, making sure that people really thoroughly shower after training and, and, and um, not training in the same gym kit, making sure that's all thoroughly decontaminated and, and so Yeah, forth. okay. Yeah. Um, and is that just specifically with this or just all of them? Uh, all of all skin infections would respond to you know optimizing your, your hygiene measures yeah we had a um we had a chap on uh, i think a couple of episodes ago uh mr bassett grappler soap so oh, yeah, he's uh, yeah. he's made a soap specifically for this nice. I'll, uh, I'll show you some it's down there actually it smells nice. lovely um okay perfect i think we've got uh, one more type of infection i believe so hot date what have you got for us paul hot date <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> look at those lips <laughs> um so what is this? Um, so it, it looks like a younger <laughs> person's face. So you might be forgiven for thinking this is in pitigo, which is a bacterial infection that we met earlier on. But actually, this is a viral infection. I think this is herpes simplex. Uh, it's a herpes infection type one, which commonly affects the, the face. You, there's another version of that, herpes simplex type two, which tends to cause genital herpes. They're the same virus just different types yeah well i think straight away when i when i think herpes i'm thinking sti yeah right. so so obviously you know there's a lot of opinions about brazilian jiu-jitsu but certainly uh on the mat you don't see too much of uh too much sexual activity no eye contact um but is this typically this the thing that you would see like on the mats Very so type so. type a absolutely this yeah. is like the ringworm and the impetiger we've talked about before this is another one that spreads like wildfire oh, yeah. direct you know close body contact yeah. because the virus the the each of these so to describe what we're seeing it's uh little sores small red bumps and open areas that we call vesicles and little blisters that then open and they get wet and there's this kind of pus filled fluid inside of them so like the impetigo, it's, it's wet, it's, uh, it, it, it's manky looking, and it often forms around the face or the lips. Um, and 
each of those little fluid filled blisters contains millions of little tiny virions, which are these viruses and viruses are absolutely tiny and, and they are very good at spreading from close direct skin to skin contact. And they're, the term for this is often herpes gladiatorium, which just describes, goes back to the Roman Empire from gladiators who used to transmit this between each other. And then in the world of rugby, it's called scrumpox from forwards that are in, you know, they're in a rock mall or a, a scrum and they're, they're rubbing faces against each other. And then this just spreads like wildfire because of that direct contact because those virus particles are just jumping from one per person's skin to the next yeah okay and do you does that have to be face-to-face -face contact or can it be any body contact any body part you this is most common in the head neck of the face but yeah. it can occur anywhere else in the body as yeah well. i mean if so if if you're if you're rolling with somebody and they've got this on their mouth um but i don't know you're on their leg like yeah. is that is that a, is that a concern or is it is it really yeah. just any part of your body that gets in contact with an active infection like this is at risk? Okay. Yeah. But I mean, if if you're not going near, so the actual infection itself, which is on the mouth, if yes. you're not near that, yeah, you're on the rest of the body. It, it, you know, is that whole body infectious? Is what I'm asking. No, not really. No, it, it needs to be direct contact with the infected area. Yeah. Basically, you need to touch it. Yeah. yeah. Or the, the other thing, just to be clear, is is what we call fomite spread. I'm going to explain what that is. <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, so fomites are, so these viruses, they can live for quite a long time. And this is the same for the bacteria and the fungi as well. If you're training and you rub your face with a towel and you leave that on the floor and then someone else picks that up, the virus is transmitted to that towel. It lives on that surface. And then the next person that has contact with that will then transmit that that to them to themselves so that's what's called fomites it's it's about touch points uh, and we'll come on to this in the second part uh, but yeah you could have a shared contact surface or item that would then transmit that from one person to another without them actually ever being in direct contact with one another mm, okay um, i'm going to show you one more picture because this potentially the same thing but looks a little, a little bit different um so has this chap just been in the desert for too long or is this, <laughs> is this the same thing? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, the yeah, he's got quite dry lips, hasn't he, anyway, but. He's a chapstick, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. A bit of Carmex, fine. Um, <laughs> but I tell you, what's fascinating about herpes virus is once you've got it for the first time, most people in adulthood have been exposed at some point. Is this virus, even if you treat it, and the main treatment for this is acyclovir, which is an antiviral. You can give it by cream or by tablets. It never goes away. Unlike tinea, which it, usually it's case closed, the virus shrinks, it retreats back into your body and it lives just next to your spinal cord in a place called your dorsal root ganglion. Okay, and then when, when you feel a bit ill, you're a bit under the weather, a bit tired, a bit run down, it come, it, that's when it re-emerges and it, it almost grows back out along your nerves and, and, and then recrudesces, is the technical term, reappears on your skin again. And that's how herpes never really goes away. It can always come back to haunt you in the future. And you can get some unfortunate souls who just have recurrence of herpes. They've had it once and then it just comes back and they might need frequent retreatment. That's a real pain and in the ass. And some people are even unlucky enough to be on preventative acyclovir, so tablets that prevent them from having these recurrent outbreaks. And um, yeah. you said there was like type A, type, a, type B. So type, type, type A was the mouth, type B was the genitals. Type one and type two. Sorry, my yep. bad. Um, Every day is a school day. It is. Um, so if you've got one, like, is that just, is that, you know, sort of different to the other or could they one transfer or sort of like transform into the other? Uh, if, uh, well, it's, it's not a, a hard and fast rule. You can see type two herpes simplex presenting in the, the face and type one in the genitals. But usually if you're someone that has contracted genital herpes, it, it, it's not the case that that's then likely to then transform into then herpes around the mouth. That usually those different subtypes will stick within their their usual zone, if that okay. makes sense. All right, fine. <laughs> yeah. So but what I'm, the key, key message really is if you're someone that gets cold sores, which is what this is commonly known as around the mouth, herpes simplex, you're not then likely to then get an outbreak around your your genitals. Uh, it usually sticks stays where it is. So fortunately, stop stop sucking people off, mate. All right, thanks, <laughs> mate. <laughs> <laughs> but it can, it can happen, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Um, just 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 to 
um, close out the, I guess, the, the return to playing time off the mats. Is it is it similar to like the fungal infection? So you, you get the cream or the anti, what is it, antibiotics or antiviral? Antiviral cream. Antiviral cream. Yeah, all tablets. Yeah. yeah. So you've got that. Um, and then, you know, what what is that period of time that you should maybe stay off the mats? And what's interesting is there's a key difference here between cold sores or herpes simplex or herpes gladiatorum, whatever you want to call it, and the other, the previous two infections we, we talked about, when they are quite responsive, so the bacterial and the fungal infections, the ringworm and the impetigo, once they're on, that, that individual's on treatment, we said two to three days, the, because this is a virus, and I said those virus particles, they're very tiny, they're very successful at spreading, this actually remains infectious for a lot longer. And the current guidance is you need, they, they need to be two weeks uh, on uh, they have been treated for two weeks um, and that needs to have ideally almost be fully resolved before they can return to play because it, it's it's infectious for a much longer period mm -hmm. okay great I don't know. yeah um, with with it being a virus is there any kind of like airborne risk or is it literally just contact uh, the, yeah this is again really really direct contact yeah and right. and fomite spread as I said contact uh, contact points all right, perfect. Um, last picture. Um, other than the Toxic Avenger, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> what do you make other, than, other than being very fucking That's unfortunate. A, that is a case of pink eye, isn't it? <laughs> it's well, well, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it definitely involves the eye, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, well, I mean, this isn't fortunately something that your audience are going to experience too often. Yeah, I was going to say, thank God I've never seen this on the mats. Um, this is actually, <laughs> this There's is no hiding that, though, is there? This is also a viral skin infection. This isn't herpes simplex. This is called uh, varicella zoster virus. And it's actually chicken pox that, re, that, that re emerges in adulthood in the form of shingles. Right. So, this is shingles. And what's interesting about this is the distribution of that rash. It's, you can see it's just that one corner of the face, just the forehead and the, and the nose. And that's a particular a nerve that, that, that runs in the face, supplies that specific area of skin, which is why it's grown at the chicken pox that, that went away from when you had it in childhood. At a period of stress, your weakest moment as an adult, it then grows out along this nerve and it infects the, the forehead. And the, the bad news here is that this has also involved this guy's eye, his cornea, and that can cause nasty scarring. So this is this is a un, very unpleasant infection. We'll definitely need quite significant treatment. Yeah, no, that's fine. The, the reason I put it in is yeah. I guess the, the individual sores kind of look like some of the other things that we've seen. Yeah. Um, and perhaps if it wasn't to that extent, maybe people might get confused about it. But I think on your face you're off to the doctors aren't you let's be honest yeah. when it's like right there yeah you know? yeah it, it, well, i think for me the message is if it looks like cold sores and it's typical for you then yet yeah, go ahead and you can treat that you might even go to the fec pharmacist get some over-the-counter zovirax or acyclovir that's great go ahead and do that but if it looks a bit unusual it's extensive like this don't be afraid to to get to get that checked out and get a proper diagnosis yeah perfect yeah. all right mate thank you that's that's been quite interesting i'm gonna be like the the rash police now i think on the mats <laughs> yeah. anything that i see <laughs> okay. um yeah we'll uh that, let's move on in a second to, to maybe like sort of offering i guess gym gym owners um or you know sort of academy owners and then practitioners or athletes some some advice before we do that have you got any other questions regarding any of the specific um conditions or anything mate no i think we got everything though. yeah i think we pretty much got everything that i would ask all right let's get these awful pictures off the screen shall we <laughs> there we go nice. did you cover everything you wanted to so yeah yeah, yeah, I think it was really good. Uh, like, uh, yeah, useful. I think the pictures have worked really well, actually. Yeah, they did. Good, yeah, yeah. it's good to uh, visually look at it while we're talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. I hope there wasn't too much jargon. I'm trying to drop a little bit of jargon in, so it gives it a bit of credibility. No, no, it's good. Yeah, it's, no, no. Yeah, it's it still kind of makes sense. It's it's. No, it's perfect, mate. Um, okay, so so with all that said, so we've just had yeah a, a kind of a good pretty much an hour of, of going through all those different conditions so we had bacteria we had fungal we had viral um so this is a curse that most gym owners have where they you know the gym we train at there's the you know in the in the toilet there's you know pictures everywhere and advice on what you need to do um but thinking right now 
you know, it's, it's around a couple of those specific conditions, but not probably all of them, in fairness. Um, and Danny and I are very good with our hygiene. We always wear clean geese. If we train a couple of times in a day, we'll, we'll change our geese. We use grappler soap. Um, so we do what we can. But that that's, you know, from from an expert's view, the what, what should gyms be doing? Um, and then we'll maybe chat about the individuals. Mm. So what do gyms need to put in place? What policy would you have in place if you were a gym owner? Yeah, I, I had a little bit of experience doing this during the pandemic, which was a fascinating time when all the gyms were struggling to deal with reopening in the midst of COVID. And we were looking at how to re reduce infection with COVID and there were lots of restrictions. And my local gym turned to me and said, well, how do we manage this? So uh, get, and then there's a lot of, I think all infections, whether that's viral, bacterial or fungal, they all respond to relatively similar measures and practical steps. And I think the, the kind of main thing is having some robust system in place for uh, disinfecting the, the equipment that, that, that your gym members are going to be using. And I just want to make one thing clear before we dive into this is the difference between um, sanitizing, disinfecting and sterilizing. Sanitizing is really just giving something once over with a J cloth, uh, you know, and that's probably what some gyms would do. And some gym members would turn up with a little towel and they'll just give it a little once over. That really doesn't do very much. Uh, you might wipe the sweat off, but if there's any residual fungal spores or virus particles, it's not going to do anything for that. Uh, then there's sterilization, which is completely almost way too far which is uh, you know, a surgical level where you're just killing everything in sight. And that's totally unnecessary and unachievable. Um, decontamination is, is really what we're, we're looking at, which is where we're, um, we're killing nearly 100% of everything, but not completely nuking the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's really what you're aiming for. And there's lots of different cleaning products that will achieve that. I'm not here to promote any particular product, but something that contains either alcohol or formaldehyde, chlorine, bleach, um, some kind of robust disinfectant. And I think for as a gym owner, you need to strike the balance between something that actually works and also not trashing your kit. Cause some of this, particularly the bleach based products will absolutely wreck your mats. Yeah. Um, and, and don't underestimate the, the benefits of just physically wiping something down and, and having, it's more important to have a robust daily regime. It's more about the systems and processes in place that to make sure that happens consistently across all your equipment in your facility than fussing over precisely what product you use. And that's one of the biggest barriers is actually making sure it happens on that day-to-day -day basis. In between training sessions, everything is thoroughly wiped down. Um, uh, and, uh, I think that's more important. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I mean, primarily the mats are, yes. are the issue in, in grappling sports and jujitsu. So where we train, I don't know what's in the, the product you might know, I don't know, but yeah, they, they, sure. they've got this big canister thing and they, they, they'll, they'll sweep get all the hairs off and yeah. then they'll literally walk, pace up and down the mat, spraying this stuff. And then someone else would then get down there with a mop. Yeah. Yep. Um, and um, then that mop sort of, the, the, that gets changed and everything else. The the issue you've got when you do that, I think, is that you the mat then stays wet for yeah. for a, a fairly yeah. decent period of time. Minutes, half hour, yeah. 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 So when you're running a busy academy in the evening and you've got maybe, I don't know, a few classes back to back, mm you know, that you probably don't have the ability to leave sort of even 15 minutes, but certainly 20 minutes, 30 minutes between classes to maximize obviously the, the evening time. And, and then also you've got, you know, uh, a session that's going on for maybe an hour and a half and people are just sort of circulating in, on and off the mats. Like how yeah. do you manage that? <laughs> and this is the biggest barrier to it being, I mean, there's a, one thing is having like a, an, a desire to do this and then the other thing is actually implementing it in a way that's actually effective and the practicality of running a busy gym where you've got back-to-back -back classes and very little change around time you've just I, th I think you have to design a system and, and get the right tools in place I mean for example the CrossFit box I work at they issued out these um, just wet wipes basically and we were we, we, we trained with barbells and big plates and and you know, you've got one paltry little wet wipe and you're expected to clean down your sweaty plate with this little wet wipe <laughs> and then at the end of the day there's this massive like pile of just wet wipes and it's just so it just doesn't work and then we try we, we so we started doing that 
to wipe everything down and then we moved to using just paper towels and bottles uh, spray bottles of, of sanitizer and that was actually much more environmentally friendly and you can actually get a good volume of cleaning product on, over the surface that you're cleaning and, and actually the thing I learned from the, the gym I work with is it, it, a lot of it's about trial and error it's about just trying something uh, seeing if it works and if not just change tack and the, what works in one gym won't work for another and I think you've just got to get a robust system in place that enables you within the restrictions of work of, of running a busy environment uh, making sure that that consistently happens every day and ideally between each each session from from the um what would you say about obviously back-to-back -back classes some people do multiple classes so say they're doing a bit of kickboxing they'll do an hour of kickboxing and then they'll jump straight over to the jiu-jitsu mats and then someone will be then say like i oh, come on i'm fresh they're all sweaty would you recommend them showering in between the session quickly, changing clothes and then coming back on to limit the risk? Or while they're still sweaty, does it really matter? And then yeah. I'm going to be sweating five minutes. That's, that's, I, I, again, I, it's, it's, it's striking the balance between what's optimal. Yeah, ideally you put everyone, you sterilize everyone in between <laughs> every session. You know, you like, give everyone an album yeah, lockdown it, yeah. with a load of <laughs> chlorhexidine. You, put, you have this big trough and you dip everyone in. <laughs> Cheap <laughs> stick like, between the mats. But yeah, your gym <laughs> membership's yeah. going to just kind yeah. of free fall, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if you start doing that so it's what's feasible and what's optimal it's yeah. striking the balance between th those two things yeah it's, it's such a hard one I don't think there's any there's no real right or wrong answer no. so it's exactly. just do your best I imagine I think to some extent it is just the nature of the beast isn't it it's, it's that sort yeah. of sport it's that sort of environment where you're going to get infection yeah. and I'd like to add sorry quickly I'd like to add our gym is super clean yeah. like our gym is genuinely super clean and we still have the issues I'd hate to think some of those gyms around the country that are not yeah. like what we're like mm. and then do you know what I mean like it must be it must be a fucking must be a nice oh, wild west out there. There's a lot of places that aren't switched onto this yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah. So, so segueing into to the athletes and the practitioners then. So gyms will have that cleaning policy in place. What should they be telling their members? What should they be doing? Yeah, so this is where the personal hygiene piece really comes into it. And uh, making sure that, I think the first thing really is the members are able to recognize and report new skin rashes, features of ringworm, um, impetigo and herpes that they know to spot those and they know that they shouldn't be ro rolling with other members while they've got those infections and that that's really key and that that isn't this big taboo it's not this you know and they feel comfortable kind of they're bringing that out in the open and they're you know not going to be hiding that away that's really key um and then I think you've also got to think about how your gym members not just interact with the map, but also all the other facilities in that gym, other what we call touch points where those infections can live on surfaces. So you've, you've got to, I mean, let's, as an average bloke that uses urinals in pubs, I know that some people's level of personal hygiene is at rock bottom. And you've <laughs> probably experienced this. I've sat, I've stood there at the urinal in the pub and some bloke will, will, will fly in and it's more of a jewelry heist, right? He goes in, he does his, he gets his tackle out. He wheezes, gone, zipped up. He's out of there. It's literally all over within 20 seconds. It's like a, it's like a military operation and he's not touched. There's no soap or water involved at any point. And then he'll go straight to the bar and he'll stick his hands in the nuts. Not his nuts, sorry, but the, the bar nuts. Probably <laughs> both. <All> there. <laughs> <laughs> One after the other nut. Yeah. Or the jelly beans, or whatever's on there. And they've done studies. They've swabbed those. Oh, man, I've it's seen horrendous. it. It's disgusting. Oh, man. my God. It's for, for urine. And I think they got rid of them now, though, haven't they? Most yeah, most places exactly. now like exactly. never have that, do they? So that's, but that's what you're up against. Yeah, like you say, most blokes are pretty switched on now. They will be washing their hands. But there's always that you know 5% who are going to be seeding infection everywhere. And I can say your hands are your ultimate touch point. This is why hand hygiene is such an underrated, undersold thing. We're really on it in, in healthcare, but perhaps some gyms need to be more on the, on the ball with this because your hands are, are unique. When you, when you pick up a, a bacteria or virus or fungal spore on your hands, you touch so many different things all kinds of surfaces that other people will also go on and touch. That's what we call fomite spread, those, those shared contact points. And as a gym, you've got to be really on it, particularly around bathroom facilities where people are touching doors and taps and, 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 and different surfaces. That is where a lot of those infections will get transmitted. And that's completely separate to what's going on on the map. Mm. Yeah, okay. And then you obviously mentioned about cleaning your attire. Um, so cleaning your geese. Um, belts should you be cleaning those as well ideally i mean they don't get as sweaty 
as a general rule, if you launder things at 60 degrees, that kills most things. Interesting. 60 degrees. Interesting. Be, but the flip side is I find it shrinks everything. This well. is this is where I was going. It. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I never wash my geese above 40 because I don't want them to shrink. Right. They're bloody expensive and they're meant to be pre-shrunk, but they still shrink. So is it, do I just need to buy a bigger size and wash them at 60? Because that, that might be, yeah. people may not be washing their geese yeah. beyond 30 or 40. Mm. What do you wash yours at? 60. 16? Kirsty's on it though, isn't she? She's, 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 she's OCD, mate. Yeah. Yeah. I smell nice tonight when you're you rolling. You do, mate, to be fair. <laughs> smell nice, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So in regard to washing geese, is that the advice and it should be on 60? Uh, yeah, again, it's, in an ideal world, that's what you would do. Yeah, okay. Um, in, our, in, our, in our gym, we have people rolling on the mats. I run the, the gym for them, so I'm, I'm the PT in the gym. Sometimes people get straight off the mats, sweaty, rash guards, come straight up to the gym and then work out in the gym. So if they're doing that, my concern, and, and I've, I've raised this, is that there then these pores these whatever this sweat is drying off a lot of the time they'll go up there and they'll do weights so they'll they'll cool down sweat still on them doing bench press you know quite casually doing this and that if they're doing that are they then just spreading those fungus pores if they've got them or creating them while they're up in that gym yeah <laughs> is that is that what's pretty much happened i'm pretty i try and clean yeah. as much as i can but yeah would you would you say that's probably not advisable maybe for them uh, more advisable would be for them to be on the mats Go off the mats, have a shower, and then come up to the gym. Would that be would that be better, like yeah. hygiene practice? Again, it's all about minimising the number of of touch points. And I I think a shower might be a little bit too draconian that, that you know, to ask people to shower be before they transition from the mats to the gym. I don't know how how well people would comply with that. Yeah. But at the very least, getting them to wash their hands. Have, have you ever seen the state of someone when they get off the mats? Yeah, I guess their whole when, point, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, it's yeah. like you've just, like, yeah, <laughs> jumped yeah. in a swimming pool, yeah, come out enough, full of enough. sweat. Of 20 people of 20 sweat. 20 people <laughs> sweat. <laughs> it's disgusting. Do you know what I mean? It's not like... Yeah. Slimy. It's, a, it's, a bit, yeah. it's even worse if, you know, yeah. you, you know what you like after yeah. a CrossFit workout. Yeah, yeah. Times up by five. Okay. <laughs> that's yeah, the only way case, yeah, uh, seeing it like that that's a really good point Danny yeah, uh, which case probably would be yeah, <laughs> helpful to have a shower but you know th this comes out you've got to make it easy for people you, you've got to provide the right facilities you've got to have your hand sanitizer right where people are going to see it uh, and just set up your systems your processes in a way that that just flows that happens consistently yeah and in fairness again to, to Danny's earlier point where we train at Phil Martial Arts it's the facility is excellent there's, yeah, there's hand sanitizers everywhere beautiful shower facilities so people do really have the ability to say fucking clean there so they should right. yeah get. yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah um i was going to ask about showering um so again probably like crossfit one thing that you find a lot with jiu-jitsu because it's very uh sort of communal and, and people are together and you'll train and then it's not uncommon for people then to sit around chatting for half an hour um drying off still in their rash guards and their geese you know is there a period of time that's optimal for showering after you stop training in order to best prevent these infections from bedding in? Uh, not really. I think obviously the sooner you shower, the less surfaces you're going to then be in contact with. If you did have an active infection, or um, then yeah, the sooner the sh you shower, the better. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Um, and anything in particular you should be showering with in regard to soap? Most, uh, the physical action of using soap on the skin will clear off most things. Yeah. You can get um, medicated soap. You have seen that. Um, it's got antimicrobial properties to it, particularly antibacterial. Some people who get a lot of folliculitis, a lot of boils, particularly on their kind of buttocks or thighs, um, they might benefit from a kind of medicated antimicrobial, antibacterial soap. It can, because of, as we said, staph aureus lives on your skin. Some people just have high levels of it than others. Mm -hmm. And they're more prone to it than causing boils and folliculitis and infections. And those people think if you get a lot of those types of infections might benefit from reducing the amount of skin carriage of staff that they have by using some like a medicated product like that. All right, perfect. Um, and in regard to, so, so we had a guy on, a jiu-jitsu guy, and he had been based out in Cameroon uh, teaching kids jiu-jitsu out there, a guy called Sam Crook. Um, and he came on, um, he's, he's back in the UK now, he came on with one of his students, uh, actually a, a, a young lad he's adopted, uh, which is an amazing story. Um, 
but he talked about skin infections. We was out there for four years and he, he talked to, he joked about the fact that these kids, they would just be pretty feral running around out in, on the farms in the mud. They'd come in, drag mud all over the mats. They'd throw their geese on like just filthy from being out. And in the four years that he was there, he got three infections. Um, and once a week they clean their geese, I think he said. Like someone would just, they'd pay someone a fiver to bring some water down. They'd be cleaning them in the street, smashing them off the ground to dry them. Uh, but he said infections weren't a major issue there. So is there anything that like, is there anything to do with our own immune systems? Like anything we should be eating? I know Eddie Brabble talks about smashing loads of yogurt. Mm. Um, is that the key? Do we just need to eat more yogurt and that stops it? <laughs> I mean, like, but, yeah. but is, is there something that we should be doing, whether it's our gut microbiome or, or anything like that, that would help us just fight these conditions yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Paul. And how can we prevent this? And I, I still want to emphasize the role, that example there, I can't give you a scientific explanation why in those relatively unsanitary conditions, your mate saw less skin infections. I mean, that sounds like Cameroon is a hot, hot climate, you know, great breeding ground for those kind of things. Uh, again, I'm not sure why that was the case. Um, so sanitation, there's a, a well-described scientific link between poor levels of sa personal hygiene and sanitation and risk of skin infections. That is universal in literature. I'm not going to dispute that. Uh, there's a lot of talk um, in terms of natural remedies and kind of more holistic medicine in the role of um, dietary modification, you know, things like acidophilus and uh, certain kind of sugars in your diet and, and the role that plays in your skin microbiome and things. I mean, it's an active area of research. I don't think we have all the answers yet, but from the literature that I've seen, I think the, 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 the kind of foods you eat are unlikely to have a direct impact on your risk of contracting things like ringworm and uh, other skin infections. Uh, Definitely, I think for me, it's a bit of a distraction. It, it, diet is important in many other ways. A healthy, balanced diet will will have re many health benefits. But I try and steer people away from obsessing over subtleties of the diet with this false promise that that will somehow magically transform them, whether or not they get ringworm. Yeah. All right. So yeah, it's more about the uh, external environment and cleaning. That's what else. the science is telling us at the moment. Yeah. yeah. All right, Dr. Will, perfect. Well, that's been really helpful, mate. And I'm sure it will help many of our uh, our friends and training yeah. partners and gyms around the, the country and the world. So really appreciate you coming on again, mate. Great to see you. Thank no you very worries. much, mate. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Good to see you.